Um, so for this last lecture, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Lingo Shelling Cloud and how you would go about um, putting your data um, and making it available and some issues to do with sort of linking your data to other data sets. So the Link Open Data Cloud is, you know, often, well, it's represented by this picture. This is the <coughs> diagram. Um, so each of these bubbles represents a single data set. So these bubbles represent, you know, each single one of them is a, already a huge collection of facts. But because it's a linked open data cloud, you can see they're all linked to one another in this huge cloud here. And, well, the linguistics part of it is mostly this green bit here. But there's, as you can see, there's green kind of everywhere on this diagram um, because there are a lot of linguistic data sets available um, through linked open data. Um, so I'll try to give you a little bit of a, an overview, a kind of hitchhiker's guide to the linked open data cloud. So, you know, as the famous book says, don't panic. Um, but we'll start off with some of the, the biggest nodes. So DBpedia is, um, well, for a long time has been called the nucleus, the center. It, it's still probably the data set with the most incoming links um, in the linked open data cloud. So basically everyone links to DBpedia if they're linking to something. Um, and DBpedia, for those who don't know, is essentially just Wikipedia turned into data. So this means that if we have a Wikipedia page, so for example here's the page for C++, then there will be a DBpedia page and the URL will map in a fairly obvious way. So if it's end of Wikipedia or slash wiki, it will be DBpedia.org slash resource. Um, and if you type in this um, URL, you'll get the um, RDF information um, about the topic, in this case C++. So you'll get lots of facts about the C++ language available as linked data for you to use in your applications. So DBpedia is implemented with something that's called transparent content negotiation. Um, and transparent content negotiation is a way in which a single uh, URL can host multiple documents. So what you'll notice is if you go, um, if you type this into your browser, um, what you'll find is that it will actually change the URL on you. So when you type it into your browser, like ebpdf.org slash resource slash c++, what will happen is, you notice up here, a bit hard to read on this theme here, but it's changed it to dp.org slash page slash c++. So this is because it's taken the resource URL and it's redirected us <coughs> to a URL with human readable content. So this is done through a mechanism that's, this is the transparent content negotiation. So if you say access it programmatically, uh, using a tool like the Linux curl command, then you can actually tell it what kind of data you want. Um, so it says, in this case, I want to know about C++, and I understand RDF and HTML. It's essentially what we're doing with this request here. And what the DBpedia server will say, great, the RDF XML version is here. So it will actually give us a URL of data in here. So this will give us the XML version of this uh, data set here. So this is basically the idea of transparent content negotiation. You can have a single canonical URI for your concept, but you can provide different versions of the data for different people. So a version for humans and a version for machines, for example. Um, so similarly here, if this is kind of more what your browser does, it says, I want to know about C++, and I only can understand HTML, and then the server will say, okay, this is the HTML version of this page. So it will give you the URL that refers to the HTML version of the data. And obviously you get something like this. Um, and you'll see of course that as well as having a very long description, we have useful things like um, links to other resources. Um, so for example here it says C++ influenced Lua and Rust. <coughs> um, and we have properties from our ontology like PBO abstract is an, is an ontology property. It says what is the abstract, um, what is the abstract from the uh, page about this concept. 
Um, we also then can get lots of different kinds of properties. So we have axioms from our, our ontology. If you remember back to Tuesday, so we can have things like this is a type of property. So designer is a type of property. It's even more it's an object property. So we know it takes a URL as its object. Um, we can have labels in multiple languages. So here it says this designer property is designer in English. But we can add, for example, uh, different translations of the name of this property so that you can localize your data more easily. And of course, external links. So it says this property in DBpedia is equivalent to this property in Wikidata. So it gives you lots of information that we can use in order to better understand the data um, and to, to use it in our applications. Um, Wikidata is then obviously another big resource. So Wikidata and DBpedia are quite, quite similar. Certainly from a user point of view, they'll be very similar, but they're different in how they're constructed. So DBpedia is constructed by taking the Wikipedia as it's written and extracting the information there. Whereas Wikidata is actually volunteers typing in data into a big database. So it's a volunteer constructed database. Um, the result of which means, of course, that the Wikidata is a little smaller, but it, it's a bit more accurate. Um, so the kind of information you get is, is quite nice. So you have here C++, a description of it uh, in multiple languages, um, um, and then also some synonyms, and other useful stuff like, um, you know, it is an instance of an object or a data programming language. So we also have these kind of axioms that we can use to do reasoning to say C++ is a kind of programming language. So we can get this information out of Wikidata. Um, another resource that's quite <coughs> useful is called Babelnet. Uh, Babelnet is essentially a dictionary, but is a, like a meta dictionary. It's lots of dictionaries put together. So it includes Wikipedia basically as a, as a dictionary. It includes word nets, as we saw yesterday. It includes Wiktionary, which is the Wikipedia version of a dictionary. Um, and Omega Wiki and information from Wikidata. And lots of other resources. Um, and it's published using the Ontolex Lemon model. So for example, you can look up something like cat. In this case, it's apparently cat underscore unix, the unix command. And you can see things like it has a canonical form. It's an empty lexicon. It has labels, languages part of speech information, and apparently 11 different senses. Um, so we can get information about words and dictionary information like we saw on uh, Wednesday from a resource like Babelnet, and Babelnet contains a huge amount of Ontolex data. Another interesting resource that's in the cloud is Lexpo. So Lexpo was an attempt to try to assign URIs to words. So essentially, every word gets a URI. Um, basically, it's fairly straightforward. It's just there's this ID. You have a URI, so lexpo.org slash ID slash term English cat, which refers to that three letter string cat being used in English. Um, so it is entirely based on strings, but it also contains a lot of useful links for things like word nets and frame nets, and it contains definitions of all the ISO language codes, which we'll talk more about later. And finally, of course, beyond linguistics, there are lots and lots of domain data sets, particularly um, in areas like uh, biology. So a big part of that linked open data cloud is bio biological data sets. So we have a huge amount of bio data sets, you know, hundreds of different data sets that you can find um, that contain information that might be very useful for building a particular application. So you can use the LOD cloud, cloud site, you can search for data sets, you can maybe find something useful for you. At least that's the idea. So we also, this is the sub-cloud, just the linguistic data sets. Um, you can see this on the LOD cloud website, and you see that they're very well linked. So we have things like LexInfo, um, that we talked about a little bit yesterday. Babelnet is here, kind of in the middle, DBpedia, Lexvo, and then there's lots and lots of corporate um, here. So there's lots of data sets available um, about linguistics. And of course, because they're linked data, they're also then linked to other data sets about other topics as well. So we have a lot of, you know, ways where you can use the linked open data cloud 
in order to get more information to build your applications. So, obviously, if you're going to be using the linked open data cloud, one of the things you really want to be doing is reusing URIs. So, when we say reusing URIs, this means using somebody else's URIs in your data set. So, as we saw with um, RDF, obviously, every property in RDF is a URI. So, if you're using someone's vocabulary, like you're using Ontolex Lemon, you, you do that by using the URIs of Ontolex Lemon as your properties and as your classes. Um, so, this is very important. It gives you data interoperability. So, this means that if lots of people use Ontolex, for example, to represent dictionaries, then one tool for Ontolex will also work for um, any of these data sets. Right. I mean, this is kind of obvious, but it, it, it's, it's the case. It would be great if everyone used the same format for everything. Um, but in reality, people kind of like making up their own formats, so this doesn't happen. Um, but because of the way RDF is open, you can actually do a little better. You can use some of the URLs, I mean, you can extend it um, in your own way. So reusing even part of a data set can really help with um, interoperability. Um, also, it's great because often these data sets that have been created by groups like Ontolex that took, you know, four years to get to their, um, or we took us four years to get to the model, um, they're often supported by some very good kind of semantic definitions. And basically, as I put here, the creators of URIs have often thought very long and hard about how the data should be. So they often have a pretty good idea of how things are represented and why they're represented a particular way. So, you know, if you go reinventing the wheel, you'll probably end up, end up with something that's not as good as, you know, the wheel that you'll find on an average car. So, you know, this is the problem with reinventing the wheel. So, if you try to reuse other people's data sets, you'll probably end up with actually a better model than anything you could make yourself. But this is not always easy. So, interoperability is a big challenge in linked data, right? So, let's take an example here. This is um, a bit of text that has been annotated with two different um, tag sets. So this is part of speech tagging. Everyone understands what part of speech tagging is, right? Yeah. So we have one part of speech tag here. This is the Suzanne part of speech tag. So it says the is an article. Fulton is noun singular. County is some noun. I'm not even sure what L L one CB means. Grand is an adjective. Jury is a noun. Said is a verb. And Friday is N B D one. So. Whereas the perhaps more common annotation scheme, which is the pen tree bank scheme, we see it's much simpler here. So this is annotated as determiner, or attribute, so article and determiner are obviously very easy, or kind of aligned. And then it says noun, proper noun, proper noun, proper noun, verb, proper noun. So we see a couple of problems here. So first of all, there are some differences in granularity. So often, here in the case, Suzanne is a very, um, detailed part of speech tag set, whereas pen just gives you very broad categories. So often when we're trying to use two different data sets, we find there's differences in granularity. But here we also see a bigger problem, but there's actually fundamental differences. So here this word grand, according to Suzanne, that's an adjective because it's part of this, whereas actually, whereas in pen, they've actually added it as part of the proper noun phrase. So the two different guidelines actually don't match up. So this is a typical thing when you're trying to use two data sets together, that they won't quite match up and there'll be differences in granularity and sometimes just fundamental differences. So let's take a, another example. So let's look at language coding. So you're probably all familiar with language coding. So in English, we represent the code EN for English, FR for French, DE for Germany, for German, uh, TH for Thai, for example. So we can sort of we can assign these two letter codes to languages. Um, so the first problem that comes up is fairly obvious. There's, well, according to um, Glottolog, there's, um, sorry, Ethnolog, there's 7,000 languages. So if we try to represent them all with two letter codes, we're gonna hit this obvious problem that we only have 26 squared codes, which is 676. So obviously, two letter codes are not going to be enough to represent 
all of the languages we want. Um, the other problem is, of course, some of our languages are, are not quite so obvious. So, you know, what is the code for, say, Brazilian Portuguese? Is it BR? No, because BR is better. So we're going to run out of codes very quickly, and we're going to end up with confusion. So if someone, and, you know, I've seen lots of people do this, tag Portuguese as at BR, and then our system then says, oh, look, here's some better on text. Um, which, of course, it isn't. So you have to be a little bit careful with this. Um, but we can, we can introduce um, three-letter codes, and we can, you know, then capture all of our languages, so we can start saying, even for smaller languages, so PMS is Piedmontese, ANG is Anglo-Saxon, so Old English, so three-letter codes can capture a lot of things. Um, um, and, <coughs> yeah, that's difficult to read, I should really fix these, some of these bubbles. Um, so we can cover all of our minority, all of our historical languages. Well, sort of, but it's not always that easy. Like Quebecois, the French spoken in Canada is, well, is that a language? Officially not. So we have to use this kind of like hack of saying Quebecois. If we want to denote this, we have to denote it as FR hyphen CA. So the French of Canada is the only way we can refer to Quebecois. Which is kind of a bit weird, because then you start thinking about, well, what about this talk? So is it in English? Yeah. But I could also say it's in English hyphen Latin. I'm not presenting here in Cyrillic, so I can say it's English Latin. I can even say it's English dash <coughs> LV. It's English being presented in Latvia. See, this is confusing. It's not Latvian English. There isn't such a thing, right? But it is English being presented in Latvia. Um, and of course, these codes start to become ambiguous. So every code can be for a country can either be a two-letter code or a three-digit number. Um, but perhaps what I really mean to say is I'm actually talking about this being English, British English, so ENGB, even though it wasn't composed in England, I suppose in Ireland this talk, and it's not being presented in England either. I am, a, I am, all, um, I am from England, so therefore it's English GB. Or we can have English Latin GB. So language tags quickly become complex, and all of these are probably okay descriptions of the language of this talk, but it also makes interoperability hard because they're all different codes, and somehow the computer has to understand that these are all probably equivalent, and you know, a tool for English will work on any of these language codes. Um, so here's the formal bit of definition I'll just read out. So, Region subtags are used to indicate linguistic variants, variations associated with or appropriate to a specific country, territory, or region. Typically, a region subtag is used to indicate variations such as regional dialects or regional specific spelling. It can also be used to indicate that the content is expressed in a way that is appropriate for use throughout that region. For example, Spanish content tailored to be useful through Latin America. So the guidelines are, are not particularly useful about when we should say regions. There's a lot of, it says a lot, but it's kind of also a bit kind of like, you know, you decide if you want to add a, lang a language, uh, sorry, a country code onto your language tag. So, an alternative is perhaps to use URLs. So URLs are great here because we can just identify anything. So for example, here is a resource called Glottolog, and Glottolog indicates what they call languages, so language varieties, <coughs> and assigns each of them a URL. So if you want to talk about Quebecois French, we can just give it a URL, glottolog.org, resource, language, ID, web, 1247. Okay. But that's great, because what we can do is we can then type this into our browser, and we have linked data, so we can then say, oh, right, I can find out more information. Someone can tell me that Quebecois is a particular version of French that is primarily spoken in Canada, and so forth. So we can then talk about particular dialects of, of French. It also helps, you know, we can now then talk about other kinds of variants of French. So we can talk about <coughs> historical variants of French, like Middle French, or local variants of French, like Jure, which is um, spoken actually in the UK, in Jersey. Um, so that's a version of French spoken in the UK. Um, or we can talk about different areas of French. Also, um, which ones are, are actually from France? 
Because Acadian is also spoken in America, right? Like Louisiana? Yeah, it is like the... Anyway, yeah. But Lorraine is in France, and I guess the <coughs> must be historical. I don't know if that refers to modern language, but you can talk about now lots of different varieties of French with different geographical and different historical usages. But when you move away from language codes, which are a bit restrictive, into URLs, which can be fully described, then we can say a lot more about languages. So, if you're then looking for a vocabulary and you don't know which one to use, there is a nice website to set up called Linked Open Vocabularies, or it's at lob.linkdata.es. Um, and this allows you to type in, saying, I'm looking for something that's a label, and it will tell you which ontologies have a property among that name. So this can be quite useful for finding vocabularies to be used. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit now about um, something that didn't work. So this is Isocat. So who here has heard of Isocat? Anyone? Thierry. <laughs> yeah, so Isocat was a, was, a, was a very big thing in sort of the early 2010s, and uh, um, at least among, among linguists, and there was this real attempt. At, they wanted to create a single standard repository where every linguistic term could be assigned a URL, and you could describe it, um, and you could bring it all together. Um, and this came out of the uh, ISO, so the International Standards Organization. Um, they have a big technical committee on linguistics. They propose models, and then they try to sell their specifications so no one uses it, because most linguists are academics and aren't going to pay hundreds of euros just to read a specification. Um, but they still go about doing this. But this was one of the open things they did, and this was you know, very big in the language resource community. And the idea was to try to you know, create a name for every concept in linguistics. Um, and basically, it, it failed. Um, so the sort of the breakdown of this, according to one of the creators, was that well, Isocad was apparently too easy to get a login to. So everyone could create a login and start creating linguistic concepts. Um, so, and this ended up with it being a bit out of control. Uh, with the result being that we had lots of entries, there were copies of our entries, and as um, Inigo puts it, people sometimes copied an entry just in order to make sure the original owner would not change the entry without them knowing it. So this is a, a typical um, you know, tragedy of the commons effect that you know, people were then defining my definition of noun can't be the same as your definition of noun, so I'm going to make my own copy of noun, and before you know it, Isocad ended up with 50 definitions of nouns, or the concept of noun. So um, this was this, this plan didn't work, and moreover it was very complex, there were lots of obligatory and technical fields that didn't really make sense, and the whole process wasn't implemented the way it was supposed to be, and the whole thing sort of collapsed. Now, they're still apparently going through this um, in the Clarin concept registry, which is being introduced, but I still haven't really seen much practical coming out of it. So. This idea sort of, you know, of interoperability of everyone coming together into one place and all agreeing didn't work out in this case. Um, so we have, our, we have our own model, which is LexInfo. LexInfo, officially, you know, it's on a GitHub. Anyone could, could contribute, but currently, basically, no one does. But it is a fixed set of categories, giving um, linguistic information at various levels. So, it includes a lot of very useful things, um, <coughs> um, axiomatized in ontology, so we have ideas like, you know, morphism and dynamic properties, like gender, and gender has a list of values, um, so it's a non-exhaustive list of values, so, theoretically, <coughs> if you wanted something else in your language, you could have something else, but we define, we kind of already define certain values, so common, feminine, masculine, neuter, and other as our grammatical genders. It also provides a lot of um, verb frames, and these verb frames are actually axiomatized, so we can say very specific things. So for example here, a transitive um, frame 
is a verb frame, and it has exactly one direct object and exactly one subject. So if you remember back to Wednesday, we talked about Ontolex. Lexifer actually allows you to say exactly what a transitive frame is, and a transitive frame is something which has a subject and a direct object. So we can actually use axioms to encode some kind of linguistic knowledge. Um, it also has a lot of arguments, so things like adpositional arguments, prepositional objects, and so forth that can be used along with the Ontolex model. Um, finally, a kind of a third attempt to try to make interoperability um, in linguistics was the OLIA, the Ontologies of Linguistic Annotation. Um, so it's kind of a modular architecture for describing annotation schemes, where you have a common reference model. So this, like Lexinfo, is supposed to be a single fixed terminology to <coughs> rule them all. And then for each particular um, resource or each particular resource scheme, you can create an annotation model. We describe how that particular resource is annotated, and then you provide a linking from the reference to the annotation model. So it uses lots of our axioms, and it's quite heavy and, and um, a little challenging to use in practice. Finally, gold. I think we talked about gold on already. Gold was quite popular in, I think, the early 2000s. Um, it defines sort of many terms, but it had very loose semantics and there's not really a clear overall model of it, it's just lots of axioms that don't quite figure out as a single system. But it's still available, and it's still useful if you want to use it. So let's say you're so inspired by this course, you go out and you make your linked open data set, so how would you go about putting it into that cloud diagram we saw on the first slide? So the first step is you go to the lodcloud.net, and there is a little Button at the top that says submit a data set. This is fairly easy, and you'll end up with a form. And the form will tell you, will ask you for lots and lots of fields. So you need to give it an identifier, title, description, some links, where the domain is, or what type. So domain means which type of data set, so is it a linguistics data set? Um, what your website is, your name and email address, because we don't really care that much about GDPR. Um, but you know, so people, but more importantly, so people can contact you, and if your data set disappears, we can be like, hey, might, you might want to put your data set back online, um, which sometimes people actually do. So these are things like an identifier, which is a unique uh, string, a title in English, a description, a full download link, your Sparkle endpoint, if you have one, um, any other downloads, or any kind of partial version. Um, a actual resource which is available as linked data, um, so a page where a URL in your data set actually resolves, um, any keywords you might have, the domains, basically the what color you want your bubble to be in the cloud diagram, um, the website, your contact point, and then importantly the number of links, the size of your data set in triples, um, and if you have things like namespaces and DOIs, or even a nice picture. And once you submit this, we'll create automatically a nice little page about your data set. We'll say, format it like this, or we'll say lots of information about it. That's your picture. Um, it'll automatically check the availability, so if your resource isn't available, you'll get this little warning sign to tell users that this link probably doesn't work. So at least we know that links don't work. Um, and will give you stars for the quality of your data, or more accurately, the quality of the metadata. So we'll say, you know, do you have all the information? Do you have all the links? So this one is missing something, so it's only got four out of five stars. Um, but as your data becomes more available, you, know, you should be able to get five stars for your data set. And that's simply it. I think it's fairly easy to put a data set into the linked open data cloud, and anyone can do it, and people are, so it's slowly growing. We also are starting to introduce, in the context of Petalod, uh, more services that will use the linked open data cloud. Um, so particularly here, we're looking at building NLP tools um, as a service-orientated architecture. Um, so that all of your, we have tools that will be implemented as self-contained operation units. So it's kind of a black box. You just use the tool. You don't need to know in detail how it works. 
um, and it could even be a comp composition of multiple services. So this means, of course, that to do this kind of goal, um, interoperability is very important. Um, so, for an example, we might want to do something like, you know, do sentiment analysis <coughs> in German by first of all putting a machine translation service from German to English. Then we can parse the resulting translation, and we can then apply sentiment analysis. So we have a pipeline that takes German text as input and gives us our sentiment analysis out as output. And this service kind of this service chain can then achieve achieve a task. Um, that otherwise wouldn't be possible. So, this is the idea. It's often very tricky to do in practice because your parser will probably output a different format and you're sent to do what your sentiment ana analysis system wants. Your translation might have lots of parameters, lots of different things. It's not always as simple as just put German text in and get English text out. Um, so, with service chains, um, you know, we need to be able to compose these. Um, so we need to be able to make these pipelines. These services need to be reasonably usable, so the um, technology readiness level, as the EU likes to um, call it, um, is often quite low, and services created by NLP researchers often have no documentation or no graphical user interface, um, and they're often very hard to install, so you have to compile from source or use some specialized libraries or, you know, Typically, working with a lot of NLP tools can be a hassle. Uh, now, you can just use pre-packaged things like NLTK, but it would be good if there was a more easy way to do it that didn't involve you having to get your tool into a particular um, toolkit like that, um, particularly as, you know, for many minor languages or many more specialized tools, this isn't going to be very easy. So to do this, we're introducing a new system called Changa. Tango being the Irish Gaelic word for language. Um, and the idea is we hope that we can take all that we've learned about RDF and interoperability um, and use this to make services interoperable. Um, we also use some other, um, we also use Docker. So, who, who here has heard of Docker? That's a lot of you. So Docker is a nice tool that allows you to basically um, have a service and all of its install, and then you just basically make like a container which contains that installed system so that you can then take it to another computer and it will run without you having to install it again. So it's like the whole install is done and it's stored in a, a single file, and then this file can be shared and downloaded between different, ser different um, servers with different setups. So the idea is we can put services as Docker and have them use RDF and link data technologies in order to talk to one another. Um, we can make them a nice front end so your NLP tool will be able accessible through the channel front end and will look nice and will have a very graceful control of the error so we can kind of see when services fail, we can see why and see what the input is and we can make hopefully these pipelines a lot easier to debug. So the idea of the system is you would start off maybe by having a pipeline where you upload some text. So here is something in Spanish. And then you would stick together your pipeline in the editor. So you'd say, for example, here's my input data. It's going into the machine translation system, and then into a suggestion mining system, and then into results. Um, and then you'd be able to look at a single service, and you'd be able to say, actually, I can configure it a little bit. So my machine translation, I can choose which language is, is taking as input and which one is output. Um, and then we can stick this together into um, a single pipeline. So, Chang'e is our system. There is also a, comp a competing system called LAPS being developed in the United States. Um, so LAPS is, is very similar to many of its ideas. Um, it uses a system called LAPS interchange format which is a kind of linked data, so it's linked data in JSON. Um, <coughs> they also have a vocabulary for web services, and they have a workflow construction tool called Galaxy, um, which also works. So this is another way in which, this is another system that is competing a bit with gender, but does a very similar idea of using linked data to try to make pipelines of language services in order to solve particular tasks. So, it looks a bit like this. Um, it's 
So uh, there's a lot of buttons, but you know, you can get the, you can look and there's lots of tools like OpenNLP and GatePods, Tiger and Stanford Pods, Tiger, and so forth available in this. So it is there. Okay, so I'm very quick, so we're probably going to be done quite early today, but that's fine. So, in summary, the linked open data cloud is pretty exciting. First of all, because it's very big, there is just humongous amounts of data in there. There are quite a lot of tools, there's lots of databases, lots of nice things for working with RDF. But it is also very fragmented, it's very, you know, very fragmented, a lot of it is, is unavailable. Um, a lot of times, you know, you get this idea of, oh, I can just stand over this link to open data set and it will work, and in practice, you need to do a little bit of hacking, a little bit of uh, what's called data wrangling. So in general, the link to open data cloud is, is very far from perfect, but I do think it's a lot less terrible than trying to deal with other stuff. So when you have to deal with someone giving you different kinds of XML, or even worse, even worse giving you like, documents um, as P uh, giving the data as PDF or doc files. Actually, you know, in comparison, you might think, actually, yeah, maybe linked open data isn't so bad in comparison to this. So interoperability is, is a very hard challenge that we're probably nowhere near solving. Um, but we're, we're trying to make some effort, and, you know, we're getting better systems now.